<laughs> Welcome back. Happy Thursday, February 22nd, 2018. I am Seth Leibson. This is the Seth and Chris Show. Buskirk is wending his way and fractiously to CPAC in Washington, D.C. There's a backup of traffic there. He'll be with us shortly. What was that with the volume there, Mr. Bill? Why, why did it go down so much? I've never he- heard that happen before. Oh, just switching what program feeds what and all, all kinds of mixed minus stuff. All kinds of mixed minus stuff. So we're still OK. We're still mass communicating. All right. We're not one at a timing here. All right. Seth? Yes. Hi, Julie. Hello. Hey. How are you? Who else is there in D.C.? This is Brandon Weikert. Brandon Weikert. Son of a gun. I'm glad you guys are there. I was just mentioning on air that uh, Buskirk was wending his way through the streets of uh, D.C. uh, to get there and join you shortly. But I'm glad you guys are there over at uh, the Conservative Political Action Conference. Well, and Seb Gorka, my old professor, is sitting two across from us, said he's going to wander his way down here in the next... Oh, Probably that's 15, that's not going to be quite so. good enough. Wa- him wandering <laughs> over. No, that is not an option. I want you to corral him, grab him, <laughs> hug him and squeeze him and call him George. Get him seated in a seatbelt. We need Seb Gorka. Yeah, J- Julie just asked me, do you think we can get Seb Gorka? And he was standing in front of me. I go, well, he was my old professor, so let me just go over and ask him. Yes. And he goes, you know, of course, yes, happily. <laughs> he is one of the great minds on foreign policy, yes. as are you, uh, well, Mr. White. you're very kind. Thank you. Thank and, and I'm a big fan of Julie's as well. Yes, we, we love stuff. Julie. Yes, oh, I've, I've actually never met her or Chris in person. Well, we so gave Julie all, all, all our encomiums yesterday, so today um, I, I was I, I meant her no short shrift. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, well, she took it. Not at all. Okay, good. We, li- we just <laughs> literally figured out, like, as yeah. you were introducing the show, how yeah. to get on here. So we're impressed with that. So we really don't need Buskirk yeah. is what you're telling me. No, well, should I tell him to go back? Yeah, he's superfluous. <laughs> he can sit in two more hours of traffic. Two, <laughs> two hours, as... five miles and two hours. That's that's how long it took me to get here. I live right across the bridge. Is there is there a uh, VIP or something at CPAC that's causing this, or just the crowds itself? I think it might be uh, it might be us. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe there is just a, a crowd of people waiting to talk to us. Brandon, let me ask know, you a question, given your sure bailiwick of foreign policy. Um, sure thing. At CPAC, the, at my memories, when I used to go there regularly mm-hmm. some years back, it's been a couple years since I've been, I don't remember there being a lot of foreign policy, national security, some, but not a lot. Is the, is how, How's its balance uh, being treated well, over, there this year? Over the years, they they did increase much they had a much greater increase i remember a couple years ago they had steven pinker yeah uh running a, a whole or not steven pinker uh, I think P- pinker or pinkett running a uh, foreign policy conference but um they've they've gotten better and okay. obviously they've had seb gorka they had john bachelor hosting a uh, an event here oh great uh, with seb and and some of the foreign john policy bolton, I saw yeah john bolton oh exactly that right. yes i saw something so, with john bolton a little frank gaffney that's yep, good yep that's yeah. good. I'm glad they're doing it. I'll tell you why. And I'd be curious, you two, um, both of your thoughts on this. Uh, I remember doing a panel here in Phoenix uh, a few years back, maybe four or five years ago, six years ago, maybe. And uh, we were talking about the Tea Party, the Tea Party movement. And one of the things I had mentioned, um, and I, I found it to be true then and, and after, was that it was interesting to me, as great as the movement was, that I thought it needed more of an emphasis uh, or an addition of an aspect of national security and foreign policy. I couldn't agree more. You agree? I mean, it is, yeah, after is all, the area, first so, yeah. object of government, and I said it was going to yeah. come back and bite us if we didn't have it right, but I'd love your and, thoughts on that. Yeah, and it ha- and, and if I may expound on that, yeah. it certainly has. Um, uh, this has been a deficit of the movement, and right. obviously we don't want to fall into the kind of neoconservative trap of democracy spreading, but I think the only way to counterweight that and to avoid the charge of so-called isolationism, as our opponents are so often trying to describe us as, I think we have to have a proactive, uh, you know, intellectual front, an intellectual argument in the foreign policy arena, and that most certainly would be real, you know, realpolitik or realism, uh, you know, the balance of power theories, the the kind of stuff that Henry Kissinger used to... uh, expound upon or an updated version of it i mean i i had in studio yesterday uh in our third hour let me just let the audience know we're talking to uh uh, julie and and brandon from washington dc over at the uh, conservative political action conference um uh, julie kelly and brandon weikert um i had in studio yesterday the former defense minister of israel uh moshe yalon and uh 
what it reminded me of in talking to him uh, just over the course of the hour and just the currents of the day is how poorly America did on foreign policy and national security under the Obama years. We've, we've talked a lot about it, but when you think right. about it, it's a record that's pretty miserable, whether well, it's the it, mistreatment of allies, the uh, launching of uh, new, new fronts of, of, of war, which we thought was not going to happen with a peacetime or at least a peacenik type president, yep. the overthrowing of more regimes, Libya, goodness knows. I mean, on and on, it's a pretty sad record. Yep. Well, and if I may, uh, I was exchanging some messages with our, I think, I think, I know Chris knows him, but our, our mutual friend David Goldman from the Asia Times, and, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Russia watcher, and so I've been monitoring Russian foreign policy very closely, particularly these days in the Middle East, and what we're finding is that um, Russia is making bold moves to displace the United States as the kind of dominant external force in the region. Now, Initially, somebody might say, well, that's a good thing because good riddance. At the same time, though, we have commitments, particularly to Israel, as well as to a handful of Egypt and uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, for better or worse. And uh, Russia is using very little military power and a lot of diplomacy and economic statecraft to really punch us in the nose down there. And the reason this is important is because Russia is trying to capture the energy markets. So as China moves to east from, from the east to the west, Russia is moving from the north to the south. And the last thing we want to do is live in a world in which uh, Russia has a sizable share of that uh, oil market. They have these sweetheart deals with Iran, Saudi Arabia, and some of the other places. And um, it's, it's very frightening watching how we've really dropped the ball with, uh, with the foreign policy under Obama, but also over the last 30 years. Let me run this by you, Brandon, as Julie goes over to charm Seb. And Chris my is guess here, it, by the way. I didn't he want her to charm arrived. Chris. I want her to charm Seb Gorko. We don't need Where's Chris. Seb? He's we right don't there. He's need come Chris. Over. No, Brandon, I, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to, I was going to ask something I have been pleasantly uh, surprised to see. I wanted to get your sense of it is, you know, for the last year we have taken this in the mouth that Donald Trump has been soft on Russia or an appeaser of Russia on any number of fronts. Lately, just lately, we're starting to see some writing in columns, even out of the Brookings Institute um, Mm -hmm. uh, by Walter Russell Mead, showing and saying that, you know what, on balance, uh, Donald Trump has been harder on Russia than Barack Obama. He's selling arms to Ukraine. He's selling arms to the... Uh, wow. You know, Har- harder on Russia than Barack Obama? I know. Well, he did tell Putin off, remember. Obama said, also, no, you also can run. Also can run the 40 faster than a brick. <laughs> it's a very low bar to get over. But no, I, I, I wrote something this morning uh, for USA Today, Seth, which is going to be out on Monday, oh, on this exact subject. Oh, good. Which is to say, you know, they say, well, he's, you know, he's being soft on Russia mm-hmm. and he's violating his oath of office. We talked about it a bit yesterday. Really? Well, who, mm-hmm. whose Justice Department is it that's prosecuting the 13 uh, Russian trolls and, and actually, for, the, for the grievous crime of buying $300 of Facebook ads in Pennsylvania? Yes. During the Obama <laughs> administration. And, and actually, Correct. And just, just to fill out that sentence, yeah. If I may also add on to that, um, my concern is actually, and I'm all for standing up to Russia because that's how you communicate with uh, the Russians is they respect strength. At the same time, though, what we've watched is after many years of sanctions and bad diplomacy from the Obama administration, uh, we've now pushed Russia into the waiting arms of China. And I can assure you that if, you, if anybody has the time, look up the name Halford Mackinder, and he is one of the great geostrategists of the 19th and 20th centuries, and he warned the British Empire at the time, and I would warn the United States as well, you, the last thing you want to see is a unified Eurasia. You do not want to see Russia and China cozying up because really awful things are going to happen geopolitically for the United States, which depends on trade and doing business with Asia and Europe. You do not want to see those two juggernauts views. And so I think a good thing to do now is we've stood up to Russia. Maybe maybe Trump should seriously entertain not just not sticking on more sanctions, but maybe negotiating a, a drawdown of the sanctions in exchange for some good Russian behavior. Brandon, as a historian and a student of foreign policy, can I ask you, we're going to a break in a minute, maybe we could pick this up on the other side of the break. Could I ask you your sense of how successful the Nixon-Kissinger strategy was in dividing Russia and China the way you're talking about now. Could, could I put a, 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 place, a, a book 
bookmark on that for the other sure side thing. of the break and get your sense of that. It, it's yours and Chris's show, so I'm at your disposal. Oh, my gosh. Then we are, we're going to ask you a whole bunch of other stuff then. I didn't know we had that much power. I'm here for two hours, so you have me. All right. Thank you. Great. You have us. Folks, if you have a question, uh, our number is 602 I'm Seth Liebson. Chris Buskirk, Brandon Weikert, and Julie Kelly are in Washington, D.C. with us broadcasting live from the Conservative Political Action Conference. We will be right back. Welcome back to the Seth and Chris Show. Mr. Buskirk, uh, welcome back to the uh, platinum microphones uh, of the Seth and Chris Show. You know, we, we could probably, we, you know what we could throw into the mix, Chris? We could do a Sammy Kershaw day, I bet. We, we can do whatever we want. <laughs> well, not whatever we want. We're pretty close. Rules pretty close. control Guess, the fun. Hey, say hi to Seb Gorka. He just sat down. Dr. Gorka, it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Greetings. Uh, Dr. Gorka, uh, thanks for being with so, us. Thanks for everything you do. I'm going to let Chris conduct the interview since he's right there with you. I think sure. it'll go a lot easier. Is this live or live to tape? We are live, live right live. now. Okay, good. Right, so... Just reel back in some of the things you were thinking. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Mind your P's and Q's, sir. Exactly. Never. <laughs> Dr. Gorka, question for you. Yes. So here's the here's the latest uh, here's the latest variation on the Trump Russia fantasy. <laughs> oh gosh. Donald Trump is violating his oath of office because he's failing <laughs> to do anything about the about the Russians, like Obama did in Ukraine. Right, kind of like that. Oh, just but, like but, that. Yeah, right, right just right. like that. Um, <laughs> Violating do, do his really oath of office. It, 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 mentally it, it, sick individuals. Okay, look. Yeah, we want to entertain them, but only for sport, not seriously. <laughs> okay, good. All right, understood. Uh, what did the Russians actually do? Look, I'm not going to be, I'm not gonna be um, bipartisan or neutral because my father was imprisoned by communists at the age of 20 with a life sentence for being an anti-communist. So I don't love KGB colonels, whether they're in uniform or running Russian, uh, the Russian Federation today. So um, you're not going to hear me say nice things about Russia meddling in our elections. But they were rank amateurs. It was the Keystone Cops. Yeah. I mean, what, in one state, they spent, what, $80 on Facebook ads? Right. The, the anti-Trump, what was it, the pro-Trump or the anti-Trump demonstration, they gathered not 15,000 people, 15 people to that demonstration in New York. I mean, it, CNN it, it's, dutifully covered it. Right. But <laughs> if you put that in a, in a fictional novel, so, oh, the Russians organized <laughs> 15 people. You'd how, laugh. It's, it's ridiculous. How many people does Michael Moore count for? <laughs> oh, ouch. I'm, I'm not going to fat shame anybody here. So. Look, um, the bottom line is I hate what covert Russian activity is being done, has been done against our great nation from 1917 onwards, whether by post-Stalinist, uh, post-Czechist Stalinists, whether by the KGB, the FSB, the SVR, it doesn't matter. But in, ca- in comparison to Hillary paying $12 million for a Russian propaganda file to obtain an illegal surveillance warrant against an American citizen, let's talk about that. Why not? Yeah, so where is the indictment of Christopher Steele? Well, look, we've had a criminal referral. The people talk about the, the, the Grassley memo. It's not a memo. The Nunes memo was a memo. The Grassley document is a criminal referral to the Department of Justice exactly targeting Mr. Steele, who, if I know well, never registered as a foreign agent, despite the fact that he was peddling Soviet-era Russian propaganda in America, being paid for by the DNC, and he is a former MI6, well, let's put former in quotes, MI6 intelligence agent with allegedly incredibly good connections in Moscow. So, Mr. Steele, I think the story has yet to be written, Chris. Well, do you think that this, uh, that this turns, or politically this turns against the Democrats? Uh, I have a, a good friend, Chris Plant, who has the, he's my dose of sanity here in D.C., he has a, the Washington radio show, and it's now syndicated. Uh, Chris, and I have to give him full credit, always loves to quote one of the best Cold War movies, The Hunt for Red October. And you know the final oh. scene where the bad Soviet right. captain, Captain Tupolev, launches the torpedo against the good Russian admiral, Admiral uh, Sean Connery, with his you know, very good Russian accent. And he, 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 you know, the, 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 the Connery closes the distance between the submarines, so the torpedo loops back to kill 
the initial yep, Captain, Tupolev. Captain and, and Tupolev's exo says, you idiot, you've killed us. <laughs> well, that's the Russian collusion narrative in America. Hillary could not stand losing. She needed a psychological crutch. That was the Russian narrative. And that Russian narrative, that the president told me one day in the Oval, it was just the two of us. He was frustrated and he said, you know what, they will never find anything because there is nothing. And they will never find anything because why are fraud charges against Paul Manafort 10 years ago because he worked for the Ukrainians? Not exactly Russian collusion during the Trump campaign. But what do we know? The steel file led to an illegal surveillance warrant using Russian propaganda, let alone uranium one, let alone everything else we know. So, yes, this is the boomerang effect. This is the torpedo that may take down a sizable chunk of the DNC establishment. And... Toward that end, uh, in regards to Christopher Steele, Chris and I here worked uh, on a document uh, called The Anatomy of a Lie, and part of the research I did, and it was pretty pretty in-depth, was that when we found some colleagues or some former college students who knew Christopher Steele when he was an undergrad, the common theme that I found was that they said he was an exaggerator and a liar. And so my question is, and you're a former intelligence man, so you know this. What what was the tradecraft that he used to acquire this information? Who were his sources? Uh, you know, none of these questions were really ever asked by the right. media. They were always kind of just taken at face value. And so I guess my question is, how long do you think the, the Democrats can continue with this narrative going forward, considering that it's built built on a house of sand? It's, it's nothing. It, it's very hard to tell because I've watched them from within the White mm-hmm. House. I've watched them from without the White House. And, and to this very day, what are we? We're, what, 16 months yep. are since the election? The Democrat Party writ large, I'm not talking about the crazies, I'm talking about you know, the leadership of the Democrat Party, is screaming for impeachment and still doesn't understand why this man won. They have no inkling as to why unemployed Steel Valley workers voted for a billionaire from New York. So what are they doing? They're doubling down. What In the last 12 months, we've seen the economy boom. We've seen the physical caliphate uh, of ISIS destroyed, NATO revitalized, R- China given you know, a, a warning shot with regards to its theft of our intellectual property. And, and, and what, what are the Democrats going to campaign on? We don't like being safe and we don't like the economy booming. And they, Trump's a KGB they agent po- or They've whatever. painted yeah. themselves into a corner. Yeah. And if you get, look, we live in the bubble. Well, I live in the bubble. You live in the bubble. Yeah. Um, you get out of the bubble, and the average American, they say, what, Russia? Yeah, come on, that's a joke. They don't I give like- it. CNN, again, it's important. CNN on a good night, Anderson Cooper, gets 600,000 viewers. If they weren't paying, now we know, thanks to Tucker Carlson, if they weren't paying for airports to put out CNN on their mm. TV screens... I think it would be Anderson Cooper and his best friends watching at CNN, and that's it. The American people, 600,000 out of 320 million, get out nobody's of the bubble. Watch, right, nobody's watching. I mean, this is what we find out. You know, I live in Arizona. People in Arizona say, this, why are you guys still talking about this? <laughs> right. This is a Beltway right. story. Right. right. It's inside the But bubble. it's a joke. Right. It's not just a Beltway story. It's irrelevant. It's laughable. Well, you, know, you, Look, know, you know the additional money in people's paychecks? Yes. That's just crumbs. <laughs> oh, right. I don't know about you, but a thousand quid, a thousand dollars when you're trying to, you know, you pay for the, for the, for the car payments when, when, when you've got kids yep. in college. That's oh, a big yeah. deal. Yep. So yeah. true. Hey, Chris, we got to go to yes, break. Sir. We're going to have Dennis Prager on the other side. I uh, appreciate you so much, Dr. Gorka, and everything you're doing, including spending My pleasure, time Sam. with us. Thank you, sir. Godspeed to you. Anytime. Say hi to Dennis. Will do. Will do. I'm Seth Liebson. He's Chris Buskirk, live from Washington, D.C. at the CPAC conference. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Seth and Chris Show. I am Seth Liebson. Chris Buskirk is live from Washington, D.C. at the CPAC conference. We are delighted to have our teacher, our guide, uh, our favorite radio host, and uh, one of America's great public intellectuals, Dennis Prager, with us. Dennis, welcome back to um, the Seth and Chris Show. You guys are great. And it's a pleasure to be with you. Well, it's going to be an even greater pleasure to be with you. You're coming with Adam Carolla February 27th to um, help film and talk about uh, your your movie, your documentary, No Safe Spaces. Dennis, um, did you ever think we would be at a place in America where we needed to have nonprofits and institutions and legal defense organizations, and now, thankfully, due to your efforts, 
a documentary, a movie actually promoting the First Amendment, that it needs defense? Did you ever think we would come to a place like that? Well, you know, uh, the the answer is that I did not. Right. Uh, had I thought it through, knowing the left as well as I do, after all that, my field of study in graduate school was, was communism. Right. And communist countries. So, obviously, the left has never promoted liberty. It, it's the, the left is the antithesis of, of liberty. Liberals promote liberty, but not the left. And I, I always make that distinction so that any liberal who hears me and thinks, well, he's not talking about me, and, and you know, then, then I want them to understand they're not the issue. Liberals are not the issue. Uh, Alan Dershowitz is in is in our film. He's That's a, right. He's a lifelong liberal. That's right. Right. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and yes, he uh, he he said, and you'll, you'll people will see it in the film when it comes out. He said the left is a much greater threat to me as an American and a Jew than the right is. I saw an excerpt of that, and good for him. He's one of the last honest ones, isn't he? That's right. I wonder if he could get tenure at Harvard today, by the way. He was the youngest tenured Harvard Law School faculty member, I think, at age 28. I wonder if he, with his record, could get tenure there today. I don't know if he would have gotten hired, actually. It's not even a matter of tenured. I I think that if he were as outspoken today about the left uh, as he, uh, as he, if, if he were applying today and is outspoken, he would not get hired. I think that's that right. Correct. I think that's right. And what a and shame. And he's a white male to make it worse. Well, yes, worse. yes, yes. And the wrong, kind, the wrong kind of minority. Dennis, um, our mutual friend Norman Podhoritz tells the story of um, that, the, the, the famous beat poet who said he would, get, he would get to us through our children. And, you know, when Norman told him he was having none of it, uh, that, uh, Allen Ginsberg said, we'll get to you through your children. Um, the children have a problem now, don't they? I mean, uh, this is this is what safe spaces are all about, the idea that they need them. Oh, uh, I actually, I, I both fear and feel sorry for a lot of young people. I fear the mob, and uh, what I saw with Marco Rubio was a mob. That was a very scary, if, if people watch the CNN Marco Rubio uh, public event, I, I need to say, it is one of the few times in my American life, which is a long life now, uh, and my whole life, uh, that I have been scared of my fellow Americans. There is a mob mentality, and it is always, always frightening, uh, a mob mentality. What I saw, the way they treated Marco Rubio, the screaming, yeah. the lack of reason, yeah. uh, it, this was scary stuff. They've never heard it. it they've never heard what he had to say before. They have been protected. They have been wrapped in, in, in social bubble wrap from the argument of the other side their entire lives. This was totally new to them. Right. And thus it's alien. Totally new. Thus and, alien. And they, yeah. don't, well, they don't hear any of this stuff. Right. This is why, and I'm, this is not a promo for Prager University because you know, stuff is free anyway. I just, I just want to say the most common reaction we get around the world, not just in the U.S., from young people, and they're the bulk of those 600 million views last year, 600 million. I just want to emphasize that. Incredible. Uh, it, it is. Uh, I never heard this before. Yep. Never heard this yep. before. Yep. And that's the real tragedy. Uh, I, I saw a tweet the other day by Christina Summers. I really liked it. I, it, it has its problems, but it, it gets to something important. She said, "I'm a dear kids, I'm a baby boomer. We are getting old, but at least we had sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Whereas today you have moral panics, workshops, and grievance circles. Time for us to rebel. You know, um, th- there's something very sad happening to our children, and, it's, and, and, and unfortunately it's happening to our rhetoric and our polity. We're going to a quick break. I know you have to run in a few moments, okay. but I'd love to get you for a few more, uh, few more and, moments and on the other side. Everybody. I remind everybody, next Tuesday at Grand Canyon University, Adam Carolla and I, this is really big. It's huge, and and we're going to come back and talk just a little bit more about that on the other side. We'll be right back with more from Dennis Prager. Welcome back to the Seth and Chris Show. I'm Seth Liebson. Delighted to have with us uh, Dennis Prager for just a few more moments. He has to run. Dennis, thanks for being generous with your time as well as your intellect. You you teach at Prager University as you do on your radio show, as you're going to do with this uh, documentary, No Safe Spaces, uh, which will be here with Adam Carolla on February 27th. 
uh, ho- uh, uh, filming and talking about. Uh, you, you teach what isn't taught. It dawns on me, Dennis, you know, if you're roughly 50 years old or older, they love what you're doing. They love what the, you're teaching. They know what you're talking about. It rings familiar to the kind of good teaching they had once upon a time. To those much younger, as you said in the previous segment, it's new to them. It's brand new. They've never heard this kind of thing before. Uh, this was deliberate, was it not? It's not just about um, uh, professors and uh, being less well-educated than they used to be, which is a problem, but it's a deliberate ideological push, isn't it? You know, I often reflect that I've felt this way since I was a kid, and I was at Columbia, and I felt uh, I felt. I think say the loneliest I ever felt in my life was my, my two years of graduate school at Columbia, huh. where I, I had literally one friend, and I make friends very easily. Yeah. I'm a very outgoing guy, yes. and I love people. Uh, but uh, I, I, I felt that I, I had entered another, another existence there. Everything I treasured, America, God, parental authority, uh, absolute morality, anti-communism, everything I treasured, differences between men and women, was uh, crapped on uh, by, uh, by students, by, by fellow students, and by their professors. Hmm. So I, uh, it's, this is a phenomenon that is somebody re- really needs to write a, a thoughtful book or essay on. How did the greatest generation, and I don't think it was the greatest, it was one of the great, right. there were many great We, we agree, we agree. How did what is called the greatest generation produce the worst? I'd My l- generation, the baby boomers, is the worst generation in American history. There are a lot of wonderful people individually in it, of course, but, uh, but it's the worst, and now they've taken over the universities, and they have wrecked them. They what? have simply destroyed, my generation has destroyed uh, the universities. They are moral and intellectual wastelands, and uh, that's 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 what we are suffering. So these kids, I said earlier, I both fear and, and some of them, and I feel sorry for most of them. To to grow up and be told that there's no such thing as a man or a woman, that you're not a boy or a girl, <coughs> excuse me, you will choose what you want to be later. I mean, I, I my heart goes out to young people. It it truly does. They have no God, they have no country, they have no gender. What do they have? Well, so, soon nothing. I mean, I think it was Hannah Arendt who put it that there are certain areas in which uh, adults do not have the right to surrender to the children, and that this is what we have done. You have been very generous with your time, sir. You're coming here February 27th for the No Safe yeah, Spaces event. Night. Folks can get, uh, we'll be at Grand Canyon University, Adam Kroll and I. They're great evenings, folks. They are great evenings. We He's can't. a remarkably funny human being and very deep. We can't. And uh, wait. you could go to DennisPrager.com dot com and go. Where's Dennis? We can't. Dennis we thing. can't wait, and we'll catch up more then. I'm looking forward to seeing you, brother. All right, Seth. Bless you. Thanks. Bl- a lot. Bless you, Dennis. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Chris Buskirk. You were there for that, and I think you've got uh, another guest joining us. Uh, do you have the great Ned Ryan with us in DC? Yeah. The great Ned Ryan. I've got. I've got the. the I'll take any Ned, Ned Ryan. Ryan. The great. Yeah, we've got the greatest Ned Ryan. We have made Ned Ryan great again. So, somebody that resembles sort of. That, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, Ned. So we're here. We're live. CPAC, Conservative yep. Political Action Committee. Um, what is the state of conservatism now? We're heading into an election year. What do you What do you expect to come from this? And do you just sense? Uh, do you sense that there's a, uh, a sort of unity? Last year at this convention, it was huge. There was a lot of energy. We just won a big election. Right. Guess what? Another election, eight months. No, I know. Um, I I would like to think that some of the trends are changing. I mean, if you look back at middle of December and the congressional generic poll didn't look very good. Republicans were down 15 to 18 points. Uh, and a lot of those generic polls you're seeing now, the Politico Morning Consult uh, poll last week on generic had Republicans up a point. Yep. So I think the more we start to see the tax bill kick in, New York Times grudgingly admitted uh, earlier this week that 51 percent of Americans think the tax bill was a good idea. So I think there is unity. People, people like crumbs. I, I, they like crumbs and lots of it. Big pile plate of crumbs. Um, I, you know, I, I joke with people, but you see even Mitch McConnell coming around. Nothing succeeds like success. And so now we've had some success with this tax bill. Again, we're only two months removed from it passing. I think we're up to almost 400 companies now that have given bonuses to how many millions of Americans. More people are seeing money in their paycheck this month in February. 
these trends continue. Jobs numbers were up in January. That's great. Almost 50,000 more jobs than estimated. Wages up. Y you see some of these trends continuing. Again, we're almost nine months away from the election, so it's a lifetime away. But I like the trends where they've gone the last six, seven weeks. I do, too. What, what do you think it takes to keep... Um to keep up the energy and not to, not to, I guess, have... Don't screw up on immigration? Yeah. That? Yeah. I, no, I, I, I don't see that there's going to be a lot of meaningful policy passed this year just because there's such a great divide, whether it's on immigration. I think on infrastructure, you'd think it'd be a no-brainer. I think Democrats have dug in and said, we are going to obstruct everything to not give Trump any success. The biggest thing for Republicans is continue to advocate and push for the right ideas on these, but at the same time, not sell out the base. I think the only thing right now that Republicans could do that would be damaging is to look like they've sold out the base on, say, immigration. There's one other thing, though, that we didn't think we'd be talking about two weeks ago, and that's gun control. Right. right? Well, that's I mean, the other, I mean, great point. The other issue, too, that they've got to go is say, listen, and I, I'm, I'm about to go on and talk about this on TV. Gun control and school safety are two completely different issues, and we know that the left has been pushing gun control for decades. You and I were talking about this before. We tried that. 1994 to 2004, we did the assault weapons ban. Mass shootings went up in that 10-year period over the previous 10 years. And then we found out, due to a De Department of Justice study, that only 6% of the gun crimes that were committed before the ban went into place were done by the weapons that were banned. And so 94% of the gun crimes that were committed before the ban went into place weren't even affected by the assault weapons ban of 1994. So gun control has always been a dream of the left. What I'm more concerned about, I've got four kids in public school, is how do we actually secure our schools and make them safe? I mean, I did this piece recently for American Greatness. We have to think about, and I want to see, the 1990 Gun-Free School Zone Act repealed in its That's entirety. Right. Because right. we're av we are literally advertising on school buildings that there are no guns here, so when a mad man shows up with a gun, everybody on this side is going to be defenseless. And so I think we've got to have that conversation. Congressman Massey out of Kentucky has put up the Safe Student Act uh, in this Congress, which would repeal every last aspect of the Gun-Free School Zone Act. I think we need to have a serious conversation about teachers not making it, of course, mandatory, but if teachers are willing and able to go through security guard training and concealed carry, I told my wife if I could have half a dozen of the teachers at my children's school who were trained, who are being regularly certified twice a year to do this sort of thing, security guard and concealed carry, to be ready to respond to a madman showing up with a gun, I am all for that. Yeah, you, see, if, it, you know, it's not about the guns, right? It, it's uh, for every time there's a mass shooting, horrible tragedy, of course, right. we know this, but we get wall-to-wall -wall coverage for weeks on end. Right. How about all of the hundreds and thousands of times every year that somebody with a gun stops a crime, that Ex protects their family, that protects their own life? These don't get reported on. Why? Because the left, which was telling us two weeks ago, the left two, two weeks ago was telling us that the only time that the police use guns is against minorities and that they are not responsible with guns. Today they're telling us that they're the only, only, people, yeah, only, only people, people should, should have, have a gun. That's right. Only the police and the, and the government should have guns. Uh, they should have the biggest and best guns, and the individual citizens of America should not. And I mean, I don't want to go too far down a path of you know esoteric conversation. I think the whole idea of law and rule of law is based off the individual and collective right for self-defense. Where do we get that? We get that from the right to bear arms. And without that, we have no rule of law or law ultimately. So, And then we're also talking about, you know, God forbid. I've I'm Chris Busker. He is Seth Liebson. Welcome back to the Seth and Chris Show. I'm broadcasting live from the CPAC convention here just outside Washington, D.C. We're in National Harbor, Maryland. I've got Julie Kelly sitting here to my left. She is senior contributor at American Greatness. And across from me is Ned Ryan, a regular columnist at American Greatness, also the founder and CEO of American Majority. Now, I want to come back to this uh, to this point about the election coming up. You've done a lot of grassroots work, yep. uh, a lot of grassroots work. I mean, the sort of work that not many people do, right? Everybody always wants to do it at 50,000 feet. You do it at the, the, the real at sea level. Yeah, the real C4 advocacy, direct advocacy of live doors and live phones. Uh, is is serious work and it's not as glam it's not very glamorous and actually when you get down to it a lot of people don't actually do what they're saying because it's not glamorous and it's very hard. What uh, so what's your advice to maybe candidates running? I mean they're just gearing up now for this uh, for this cycle. I mean they, they we know who yeah. the candidates are they're, they're getting always, their signatures. What should they be doing now? Uh, the the thing I tell candidates you can't control the environment of all the stories that might be breaking. What's going on? The only thing that you control is what is within your power. Are you doing the proper fundraising? Are you laying out a metric-driven campaign and saying, we've got to get 20,000 votes to win? Have you broken it out into a campaign calendar with weekly goals on doors and phones? Have you laid out all of this thing in a very systematic, metric-driven 
campaign that you do everything that's within your power to win at the same time we know that there are stuff that there, there are things that will come from outside of a campaign that influence it that are out of your control so i tell them do everything that's within your power if you're doing all the fundraising you should be doing if you're doing all the live voter contact you should be doing if you're driving the right message you've given yourself an excellent chance of winning but at the same time sometimes great candidates who have done all the fundamentals they still lose um, and that's one thing I think that the Democrats are going to have a disadvantage of in the Midwest in some of these Senate races. Because, a message? <laughs> well, the message, but also who are their foot soldiers? Usually union workers, right. really Trump voters. And so, you know, when you're talking about going, knocking on doors, knocking on doors you know, live registering calls. voters, right. all of that grunt work. Who's going to do that for the Democrats in Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio? I mean, that, that, so the one... I guess the comeback I would come with you is uh, the left is actually fairly energized at certain levels. You, you've seen that. I wrote a piece two or three pieces ago for American Greatness that, that it, the left is winning state legislative seats that they shouldn't be winning. So there is a certain energy in the left's base. At the same time, I think you start talking about these issues of immigration, if Democrats take back the majority, gun control, all of these things, I think there are ways to motivate the Republican base. But you're right. I mean, the unions aren't quite what they used to be, so there's a lot of advantage I think we'll have in the midterm if we do the fundamentals correctly and we continue to push and promote the tax bill. Yeah, that's number one, right? right Kitchen exactly. table issues. People right. are going to at work. How do they affect the, the, their pocketbook? Are they putting more money in their pockets? They can pay the mortgage, put more food on the table, have a better future for their kids can't say it any better than that. Ned Ryan, thanks so much for being with us. We'll be right back with more of the Seth and Chris Show broadcasting live from CPAC outside of Washington, D.C.